What's going on, everybody? It's Jeremy Powers, and you are listening to the seventh episode of the GCN Cyclocross Podcast. We have a fantastic show planned for you guys this week. First up, Marty and I talk all about Ellen Noble's return to the podium at the Ruts and Guts C2 races that went down in Oklahoma in the United States. Ellen's had a super tough beginning of her season, but she's able to take the top step this weekend with two victories back to back. Then we chat about the Urban Cross in Kortrijk, Belgium. It was a super fun race to call on the weekend. If you didn't see it, check it out live over on GCN Racing. It was really, really beautiful course, something totally different than what we normally see. Marty's turn to catch up with Top Verdeka, Verveka, Edwin Vervecken, all about what goes into creating a course like the Urban Cross in Kortrijk. It was really fun to be able to listen to Erwin and hear Marty and him jam about what goes into it for Erwin to be able to make a world-class cyclocross course. We talk about the racing coming up this weekend with Mariana Voss making the return turn in Essen as well as Sunday's race. It's going to be a good weekend. If you're a fan of cross, this is one that you don't want to miss out on. Then our featured guest is my friend, Simon Zahner, a rider that I've raced against a ton over the years. We talk about all kinds of stuff, being on the podium of the World Cup and the World Championships, being national champ, having a family. It is a fantastic conversation with a good dude. So I hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. If you haven't yet, please subscribe. Please review it. Please let others know what you think. Share it on social media. If you're on social media, hit us up at GCN Tweet on Twitter and at Global Cycling Network on Instagram. Let's hop into this one with my pal, Marty. Hey, Marty, how are you this week? I'm good, my friend. Very, very good. Dude, we had such a great week of cyclocross. The talk of the town here is Ellen Noble, her return to dominance over the weekend in Oklahoma. It was the race called Ruts and Guts, and she was able to double up on the weekend. It was fantastic to be able to see her return to form. Do you know what? The biggest thing I love is the names that you guys give races over there. It's just like, when I look back through results, yeah, Ruts and Guts, I love that one. Yeah, I think <laughs> for, for people around the world, just to see Ellen back, hands in the air, top step of the podium. But I think the important thing to point out as well, and I'm sure you'll back me up on this, not just once, but twice in a weekend. Beyond the results, right? Isn't it just about feeling good? I mean, <laughs> bike racing is one part, but just feeling good and getting back out there and getting that kind of the momentum from your your fans and from the people that are out there supporting you. It's just that's that's good. And then this weekend it was awesome because we got to call the Cortric Cyclocross. It was the Caps Urban Cross. What did you think of that? It was different. I loved it. Do you know what? I absolutely loved it. I mean, it was one of those things and you look and you think Urban Cross and you can kind of be a little, sometimes you'd be like, Mwah. you know, this, is, this isn't going to be tough. But I think it gave us some of the best racing that we've seen in a while. And, you know, in particular, the in the men's race, I think, because Mathieu van der Poel was sitting back in the group, whether that was through choice or just how quick and how narrow that it was. But everyone got like, they were like a, a whole bunch of excited little puppies. They were like, ah, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And it was like, they were burning matches and using power beans to like left, right and center. <laughs> and then you got one of those things and everyone will love it as a pro rider. I think you called it about 45 seconds before it happened. He came into a section, you were like... Ah, oh, he looks frustrated. I think he's going to go now. And it was down onto down onto the water side. It was like, bang, you know, it was, it was awesome. I know, man. That was a fun race to call because everybody had their, uh, had their strike. You know what I mean? Everyone shot out, tried to take it. They thought they had, they'd seen Vanderpool's weakness. They thought they had seen Koppenberg over a year ago before the 35 win streak started. They all had a shot at it. And that was, that was fun to watch. And I think it made for a very exciting race. One of the people that is a big hand in this is a friend to the show, Erwin Verveka. You were able to catch up with him. Tell us about what you guys talked about. Yeah, it was my turn this week. It was great. I, <laughs> I, I love chatting with Owen. He's got such energy. He's just, uh, yeah, really fun to chat to. All right, let's hop into this piece with Erwin. Hi, Owen. Thanks for joining us. What's the process of selecting a new course like Core Trike? Is it, is it an approach from the city? Is it something you just happen across? And, it, and is there any more that you might be able to tell us about coming up in, in the next few years? Uh, well, it's all always a process, of course, of a, a city asking us, hey, we are very interested to have a, a, a new event. Um, it's not us searching for, for new locations. Uh, it's more the cities who approach us. And, and we have much more requests that, that we can handle because the, the places on the, on the UCI calendar are very limited. So, um, And then it's, uh, yeah, they propose us courses. I go and check them out. 
in Kortrijk, we also had another option, which we which was really nice. But um, yeah, uh, it's also a matter of getting the approvals from from all the landowners, and that was a problem there. So we ended up in the city center. And yeah, for city marketing, of course, the city will be very happy because it's it's really in the city center. The design always starts with where do we put the the, the bid zone? The bid zone has to be centralized, has to be a large uh, field, uh, minimum 25 by 60 meters. And then from there, you start to create uh, the courses. And I just walk around, uh, have something in mind, and then I start to create it from, from actually from Google Maps, because then you have the, the aerial view, and um, yeah, it, it, the simplest way to, to create it like that is uh, yeah to, to design it and and then finalize it. Huh? It's the, the first version is always a good version, but then you have to yeah uh, um, change it every now and then with, with with new things. And 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 even in the last week, this week we made some small changes because the video is so on Friday it will be slightly different on uh, now on Saturday. Uh, just a few corners where we put the poles a bit wider or, uh, or this is not hard enough if we put the pole 20 centimeter further it's it's even harder so things like that is there anywhere that you've just you've stood as you've been on on your travels or anywhere and you've just stood there and gone i oh, i've got to i would love to organize a cross race yeah. here oh, very often very often i uh i am I'm traveling a lot, uh, and besides uh, my cross uh, yeah, uh, projects uh, with Golazo, I'm also manager of the UCI Grand Fondo World Series. So I, I travel worldwide, and I'm often at locations where I think, okay, this could be amazing. But then, of course, uh, yeah, you have to bring all the top stars there. Um, so the best is, uh, yeah, to, 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 well, Flanders is still the, the home country, yeah, the, the, where it all happens. Uh, um, but even even in, in my own country, I often see very nice locations. Uh, but the problem is, yeah, convince, first of all, the city to do it. Uh, and then second of all, have a place on the UCI calendar. And that's often a big challenge because, uh, yeah, I, I hear from the National Federation that in Belgium, there are at least uh, three, four potential new events uh, waiting for a place on the calendar. That was amazing. That's great to hear from the boss of Cross right now, Erwin, doing all that stuff with all of that passion and knowledge and know-how, everything that goes into that, you know, all that Google Maps, all the just interesting bits that he gave us. Definitely, if you're a aspiring course designer, there's no question that that is an interview that you should click and save on. That was awesome, Marty. Really, really great interview. Thank you for uh, thank you for chatting with him. We have some pretty serious racing coming up this weekend. Yes, we do. And uh, I almost I almost feel another epic voiceover coming on because <laughs> Voss the boss is back. Been waiting for her to come back into cyclocross and she's returning at the Etias series in uh, in Essen on Saturday. Uh, check that out on GCN Racing. That's uh, worldwide, excluding Belgium and Netherlands. And unfortunately, as we know, we don't have that in the US and Canada. So our apologies for that. Hopefully in the future, the magical unicorn rights fairies will open that one up for us. Then we go to Zonhover on Sunday. And I'm sure that is that one that you've done. That, that's the one where I think uh, Ollie Bridgewood uh, here at GCN, I think the altitude on those uh, those sand bomb holes, he was getting a nosebleed at the top before he went into them. Yeah, I think Zonhova is one of the classics of the cyclocross. I never raced it. It never fell at the right time with the U.S. National Championships and training and all of that goes into a international rider cyclocross season. So I was never able to do Zonhova as a race, but I did get to go over there and we created a really funny video. It's I think it's at 200 plus thousand views so people seem to like it Oliver crashes a lot he had never ridden anything like that before and so it was a it was a fun experience to be able to teach him and have him ultimately be able to conquer the goal of Zonhova and it was uh it was a, it was really cool if you guys aren't familiar with the race it is such a unique track it's basically this massive sand dune and it's probably a 20 or 30 second descent downhill sand into a big bowl where fans kind of line it on the sides it makes for some 
some of the most iconic pictures and some of the most, one of the most beautiful cross races, I think. It, it really speaks to everything that cyclocross is. It is one of my, definitely one of my favorites, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to commentating that race with you on Sunday. Yeah, and also we've got Beth Crumpton with us on Saturday as well, and that's, I'm super excited to get Beth back in the commentary box with us. She was with us last winter. Uh, people have been out there watching her in, in the World Cups, in Cox Cider for Tata Leto Issa Rex. So I always love getting a, a, a the viewpoint of someone that's out there this season kicking it with the best in the world. So that's, that's really exciting to see Beth back this weekend with Ye us. That's awesome. I, Marty, am also racing on Saturday. I'm <sighs> racing... Yeah, in Warwick of Rhode Island. It is a big race here in uh, New England, and we just got a foot of snow. So it's going to be interesting to see what the course is like when we make our way down there on uh, on Friday afternoon. But it's not a far drive. I'm going to be doing a video for GCN about like how to get ready for the cross race. I'm also going to be doing my first race in about a year. So that should be interesting. I wonder, I'm pretty curious to see how I do with not a ton of training. Can you remember how, what it's like to pin a number on? Have you, have you, <laughs> you've never forgotten that yet. No, you, <laughs> unfortunately, you don't forget that part of it. <laughs> If it's snowing, are you going with the Sven Ney slicks as well? That's going to be interesting. It's a very fast track. It's got a, uh, it's got some ruts and some roots in it. It's sandy. It's got a, it's got just about everything. It is really a beautiful course. It's actually where I took my last pro win of my career. So I'm, um, it, it has some good memories. A lot of my family and friends are able to come out. It's very close to where I grew up in Connecticut and where I live now in Massachusetts. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a nice return for one day, for one hour. See how I fare against some of the uh, country's best. So you'll need to have a sit down on Sunday, will you? <laughs> I might need to have an extra coffee. How's that? <laughs> well, good luck. I can't All wait right. to see that. It's going to be no. good. Thanks, Marty, for your time today. No worries. Have a good one. So that is a wrap with Marty. Always great to be able to catch up with him and talk about all the things that are going down on the cross scene. Next up is the man of the show, Simon Zahner, the 36-year-old born, raised, and currently living in Switzerland. He's Swiss through and through. He's a rider that I've raced against over the years, become friends with, and I really enjoy. You know that kind of guy that every time you go to the race, you see him and you're like, hey, how's it going? How are you? I'm sure if you race, then you have one person or a couple people like that that you really look forward to chatting with. That for me was Simon's honor. As a matter of fact, all of the Swiss riders, I truly enjoyed getting to know and having relationships with over the years of racing. Simon's had a fantastic career. He's been on the podium of the World Cup as an elite rider in cyclocross, as well as the World Championships as an under 23. He was national champ as an under 23. He's been second five times as an elite at the national championships in Switzerland. We talk all about his family life. He has four kids. This was a really fun conversation for me. I enjoyed it immensely. I hope you guys will too. Let's talk into this one with Simon. Thanks for having me. It's awesome to have you, man. You're from Switzerland. You're 36 years old. You were also born in 1983, which is the same year that I was born. We've known each other for a super long time. It's a real pleasure to have you on Thanks today. a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Let's jump into it because I think that a lot of riders or fans that are listening to the show, they might not know who Simon Zahner is. So I always like to just give an opportunity for the European riders to be able to sort of take us back a little bit, how you found the bike and how you got into racing. I got into mountain bike racing first. And the story is that I always blew up like three quarters into a race because I never trained endurance. But I was always like jumping around in, in the garden or on the stairs and stuff. So I had a good technique, but no endurance to survive the distance of the race. Then, like with 16 or something, a few friends and myself, we joined a bicycle club. And um, this guy said, yeah, maybe you should try cyclocross because in your category, the cyclocross race is over the moment you actually blow up all the time. So um, I started to have a little bit of success and it was already nice not to finish every race with like, you don't see straight anymore and afterwards you don't know what happened exactly. Yeah, and then I've been mostly racing cyclocross every winter and first it was still mountain bike in the summer um, and then switched over more to the road, got better on the road every year and, and then I had my two years uh, with BMC in a professional team on the road where I didn't do cyclocross. Yeah, after that was finished. I always knew I wanted to go back to cyclocross to have at least one more season where I really focus on cross instead of one more season. Now there's been a few and um, yeah, still 
still going on and liking it. Something that the people that are listening to this show might not know is that, well, you're married and you have four kids. It must be crazy. I mean, for us, it's uh, n- not crazy. For us, it's normal. Maybe it's crazy if you look at it from from outside. <laughs> but um, That's the best attitude to have. Yeah, I met my wife or my then girlfriend, now wife, 17 years ago. Since then, she has been to every world championships, I think, except for the one in Belgium, in Hoogleden. Where she like her first first kid was two months old, so then she she stayed at home, and and that also shows that she supported this from the beginning, and we we didn't get to know each other, and then she found out that I'm doing dreaming of of uh, earning money one day with racing bikes, and and then she said, oh no, pff, I would rather have a, like a guy who works in the office and and is home at five thirty. We've been traveling to races with a uh, with an RV for the last three and a half years. And there's always one or two children who can come with me the day before the race and, and sleep there. And, and so it's also a little bit of holiday for them every time we go to a race. Love that. I love that. You guys make it work for you. And uh, yeah, can it just, I think it's a very unique skill set to own, to be able to manage your racing your training, your life, and have four children um, and a wife that really supports you in what you do. And um, yeah, definitely a, a golf clap for you for, for managing all that and having success that you've had and um, having children for that long. So yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about how you came up because there's been there's been quite a few races that we didn't maybe know each other at the time, but we raced together a lot. If we look back at it, you're one of the last riders that's racing from 1983 in the like pro cyclocross peloton if we'll call it that what does that feel like now for you for me it doesn't feel like anything special but in the last years journalists call and and do like their preview and for the last two years the subject has been like uh, now you're the oldest or before the race okay you're the oldest on on the start list uh, what does that mean to you and that's how you get reminded of it, but it's a, it's a cliche, but I think you're as old as you feel and not about what your passport says. We have this new UCI number since, I think, two years that are no longer the date of birth in some combination and your country, I think. So it's, it's, it's a bit better for me that you don't directly see at every <laughs> start list that, oh, man. And the, and the the only one with uh, eighty three, and then it's like four years no one, and then the next. So, <laughs> yeah, I try to n- not to think about it too much. Yeah. Say. You know, I hope that you go for as long as you want to and continue to tear it up. But you've been a rider that's had a lot of consistency. So having been on the podium that many times, I think when a team looks at a rider or someone looking from the outside in, you're constantly there. You're always in the picture. Maybe you don't win every single race. You know, you don't have 100 plus wins, but you've been second, third. Consistency has been kind of the thing that I would I would definitely put uh, next to your name for sure. And then one of the rides that I to say that you know having known you for such a long time was that 2013 world cup in hoogerheide in the netherlands so before i jump into that i just want to hear about the world cup win in 2005 and that entire season what was that like that was a big time in your career yeah sure it was my last year under 23 uh, the year before i was uh, i think fourth at european championships so i was always chasing that that medal at a big event yeah i knew that's that's like the last the last year the last shot i have and that was two minutes before the next Swiss guide during the whole season. But at at Nationals, which was uh, my home race, I just couldn't drop him. Of course, he loses the sprint and <laughs> gets second place. And, and everyone is like, oh, how could that happen? And uh, the week after, I took nearly two minutes out of, of everyone at the World Cup and, and bounced, bounced back another time uh, at World Championships to get third. And that's a bit my story to to maybe mess it up where everyone thinks you should perform. Like a few days after, I can (laughs) maybe maybe freer in my head and and then like the good stuff arrives. So it was also a week after Nationals where I got second and just rode this race. And if I look at it on, on YouTube, I have to say also technically in snow and ice, I think I didn't steal that one. You know, so uh, 
that was just a good day on the bike. Yeah, 2004, you were national champ under 23 in Switzerland. You unfortunately you lost the sprint finish in 2005, although it seemed like a shoe in to many. And you had won the World Cup in no May, and then you smashed it out and got third at the World Champs in St. Wendell. You know, I think it's just a great story. I don't want it to go lost. Is that you know, even though you didn't win the national title, you almost you almost bounce back and you take what I would consider to be more prestigious wins at the World Cup because it's an international field. And I'm just going to go through a couple of people that were in the top ten there behind you: Lars Boom, Niels Albert. Kevin Powell, Steve Chanel. Yeah, some of the biggest names in the sport. It's also the reason why I'm not sad that I haven't won nationals yet. Or maybe I'll never win nationals, who knows. Because I know what I really learned. And when they say you learn a lot of stuff for your life in, in sports, what I really learned is like you, yeah, maybe you'd be for, for one and two days, but then you try to get out of it and then dig yourself out of the hole yeah, and, and, and show what you're really capable of. That's what I showed to myself mostly numerous times. And I'm, I'm happy so far, but it's, it's maybe also the reason why I didn't think five, six years ago, okay, now it's time to quit because I've reached everything that, that I can possibly reach. Somewhere in my head, I'm still chasing that, that jersey a little bit. <laughs> You're still hungry. Yeah, why not? But uh, <laughs> two years ago, you were very close, twenty seconds away from the win. Yeah, but I was beaten like, uh, how do you say, fair and square. Yes. Um, last year, there was a lot of melted snow, like ice water, on the course, and in the last two laps, I couldn't, I couldn't see anymore. So I was basically riding the course on, on, on memory from the recon. And uh, like there, it really slipped out of my hands. And, and that's the only time nationals where I was really convinced that this one I should have, that was mine. After that, I had the best World Cup race of the, of the last year, even if, if it's not a result to be proud of. And Worlds was a good race for me and to, like, to make peace with the, the whole season. I still had the best two races of the season after that nationals race. So that's like one more time, just uh, try to keep your head up and don't give up and yeah, go on and enjoy it. Yeah. You've been racing a ton in Switzerland recently. Your title sponsor is EKZ. They're very involved in the, the big tour that happens in, in Switzerland, the big series. You guys have created a whole new planet over there for cyclocross. Yeah, that started because organizers realize that they are better off having a, a race for everyone there's uh, races for for like the hobby riders in the morning kids races between like the, the elite races or in the break when we get on the course for the recon there is a little course with kids races for for like you can go there with your two-year-old so it's something for the whole family and it's uh, most of the times free entrance and uh, younger music and, and like a uh, impression and the outfit of these races are not what we had before that where it's just like the, the same music tape that they played for the last 20 years <laughs> was still running and uh, like it couldn't the young people couldn't really see themselves going to a to a cyclocross race anymore and now a lot of people go there and ride for themselves in the morning and then stay to watch the races and that's how you can attract sponsors because people uh, identify themselves with with the sport you've been doing this your entire life right you've lived for it you've been part of it for many different series many different renditions like the greatest moments of cyclocross maybe some of the worst you probably know as much about the sport as as anyone it's a yeah it's a unique skill set i guess well the natural place to take this is is also that you're part of the uci commission i i remember putting your name down and voting for you in luxembourg and uh, all of your peers did at the world championships they all voted you in so what do you do in that role and what's that experience been it's like? It's been a, a great experience and really, really interesting. And it also, I have to say, it also opened my eyes a lot. And I have to sometimes like step back a little bit. And it's it's really easy to always say, oh, the UCI here, pff, the UCI there, and and the course is too narrow. Oh, the UCI should do something about it, and so on. 
if you actually see how many people are involved, how many rules and companies and different people who all have like a, a doctor title in their name. Yeah, I saw that, that a lot of times there's more behind it than just someone did the, went the easiest way. That sounds like it's super fun. You just got back from a meeting where you guys were talking about all kinds of stuff that's going to be happening. A lot of changes. We'll just we'll just leave it there. You traveled with some of the cyclocross greats, Christian Hoyla, who famously finished his career out here in the United States. And I did some great battles with Christian and became good friends with him over the time that he raced here and throughout the years. You probably looked up to and, and had great battles with Christian as well. But also Marcel Wildhaver he was a good friend to you. He trained with you a ton, traveled to the races, loved to know about about the crew that you would you would travel to the races with because you guys you know switzerland's not right next to belgium it's uh it's like yeah you guys have to drive in the car six eight whatever hours to get to each of these races you have to kind of be brothers in arms as we would say our setup i travel with a mechanic and marcel travels with his mechanic these guys go to the pits and you you just hope that marcel and me we, we don't enter the pits every half lap together so like my mechanic picks up his bike when he has to switch and uh, the other way around. So you combine forces at the race and, and you also say, okay, uh, who takes this to the race? And I travel with my RV. So if everyone takes a shower in my car, so they don't have to, to find a shower if it's, it's far away or, or the showers are at World Cup races are closed after the under 23 because they think every pro has a has a mobile <laughs> home anyway. Yes. <laughs> it's the moment you cross the finish line you're, you're you're good friends again, not only friends but good friends and make life easier for for everyone. You guys have, I think, probably a pretty unique relationship in that regard because you also fight for national titles. You guys fight in the EKZ series. You guys fight often um, in the racing, but you guys are training partners. And yeah, it's a unique balance. How do you balance that? It's such a tough one, having had a lot of friends that I've been competitors with. Do you guys chat on text and like keep in touch throughout the season? Would you consider him like a best friend or is he someone that you work together with and you keep in touch with out of a convenience? Do you find that you're, you're more than that, that you guys really, you've shared a lot of the battles and the struggles ups and downs together from one point of view it's hard to say because this sport takes up so much time and then there's family and then there's all the other stuff so i don't have time for a lot of friendships so basically the 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 only people i have a lot of contact with are people that i share my job with so i only have or mostly only have racing friends it's hard to tell how Marcel and myself, for example, would would go on if we just worked at the same place and you, you meet each other every day, but but then go home at five in the evening and yeah, have no like no no reason to have contact after after that. But um, from the race in in Hogerheide, I remember when I got back from the press conference, Marcel was still waiting in the in the kindergarten there at the at the corner in Hogerheide for the doping control. And when I entered that room, we were like him and his mechanic, we were like nearly crying because everyone was so happy that I, that I was on the podium that day. So like my first memories from that race are arms in arms with, with my competitor. And he was so happy for me. Beautiful memories, man. Yeah, exactly. Such, such great memories on that friendship that uh, you just forget that you unfortunately have to ride against each other for an hour a week, basically. But it can still be for, for the remaining seven times 24 hours, it can be friends. <laughs> Yeah, I also wanted to make sure that I did talk about this. So in 2013 at the World Cup in Hoogerheide, it was the race, I believe it was just before the World Championships. Yeah, it was snowing out. The World Championships were going to be in Louisville that year. So I didn't go. But historically, the Belgian riders have not done well in snowy conditions. It's not their strength. Mostly yeah. the Czech riders and a guy named Simon Zahner is really, really good in the snow. This particular Hoogerheide had a lot of snow on the ground. It was very slick conditions. And I had been training my butt off in, in Louisville, but 
glued to the television because a guy that I was friends with that I really, <laughs> you know, looked up to, good competitor, like just really someone that I enjoyed spending time with at the races was in a position to get on the podium mm -hmm. and you did. You got third place at the World Cup. I think about all the time when I talk about what's possible for a young rider that's coming up. I always say like, hey, look at what Simon was able to do seizing mm -hmm. that opportunity. When you lined <laughs> up for that race, Thanks. yeah, when you lined up for that race, did you have a sense that it was possible or did you treat it like every race and you just got into it and you did your best? Well, the thing is we were flying to the States the two days after that. So in, in my head, I was already pretty prepared like after that we go home and on monday i pack all the bikes and tuesday morning we go to the airport and so on and so on and when we came to the hotel there and the road from the hotel to the course you go you can take the road or you can go through the forest and we went we said oh it's cool we go through the forest and everyone around us was crashing and and i didn't crash so that that was the first moment where i thought yeah it's Snow and ice is still is still pretty good for me. Unfortunately, with global warming and stuff, we you you don't race on it a lot anymore. <laughs> but uh, I thought, no, that's 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 pretty cool. And I had a super good feeling in in training on Saturday. And then I rode again from the hotel to the course on Sunday, and it was so cold. And and yeah, there I just thought. I've not been complaining for the weather from from when I arrived here. Even if it was super cold and super slippery and super dangerous and stuff. So I just had a super good feeling but I didn't I didn't think about uh podium or, or whatever. But uh just a confidence on, on my abilities in these conditions. You know, you're a rider that has fought for each of these results that you've gotten, right? You've been very consistent, but I think just for me, being on the podium of a World Cup and seizing that opportunity, I don't know, man, just, you know, I'm just saying, like, congrats. It's a huge, it was a huge moment. I remember it vividly. And yeah, um, I, I remember yeah. every second of it, I think. <laughs> did, what, 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 um, let me ask you then, let me ask you this then. At what moment did you think it was possible and what did you do? to not freak out it's not on camera because the camera moved like in the second it happened but Bino had a little bit of a gap to Lars Vanderhaar and in in second and then there was a little bit of a gap to to me and then behind me was Radomir Shimonek and then Sven Nice. and you go from the VIP tents onto the, the little road where now there is the the two barriers and from that little road, you you had then you had the the steep run up, that is no longer on on the course now. So and then a, a, like a little downhill, where nothing bad can happen anymore, I'd say. And, and but I I was in third place, but Radomir was behind me and then Sven. And when we got on from the grass onto the snow covered road, uh, Radomir slipped out behind me. So then I knew. I have at least uh, like a two bike length to to Sven, and if I don't mess up the the little downhill before the finish, I still have the two bike length when we go onto the finishing straight. And uh, yeah, that's that's where I just thought now don't don't waste it. Now it's the, the that's that's <laughs> most most important twenty seconds of your life. You did it. it worked out. <laughs> It's cool, man. So yeah, so Martin Bina, the Czech rider, takes it. Lars van der Haar flies in for second place, and then it's uh, Simon Zahner there in third. So I hope that you race for as long as you want to, but as I tie this interview up, I think I know that you would like to win the Swiss National Championship. What is what is on your to-do list still in your career? I mean, Worlds in Switzerland is, is pretty huge for us. For me, I didn't win a lot of races. But uh, the race in Dübendorf has been held, um, I think, from 12 years ago to 10 years ago. There have been three editions. Um, on one, I was sick, and the other two, I won these races. So, the, like, I have a 100% winning, <laughs> winning rate on that course, and and it. So I don't, I don't think I will, 
I will win world championships, of course. Just to to go there from the moment that it was clear that worlds will be held there, for me it was clear that that's that's the day. I think about every morning when I get up and and every evening when I go to bed. There's tons of stuff that I would love to do on the bike that I always had to say, oh no, now I can't do this bike marathon in in beginning of September because cross season is near or uh, stuff like dirty cancer and, and all that. So lots of stuff still still to do. Lots I love of bikes that. to ride. <laughs> I love that, man. That's exciting. Yeah, I, uh, I look forward to that. And for Swiss Cyclocross with the EKZ Tour, with the World Championships coming this year, you guys have a lot of momentum, man. It's a great time to be in Swiss Cyclocross. Yeah, sure. And uh, what I always say in, in the last few years, for me, it's super nice because I came into or I started cyclocross when it was disappearing in Switzerland, basically. So like 20 years, 25 years ago, we had uh, we had worlds. 30 years ago, we had uh, like every fourth world champion was not a Swiss guy, maybe. Um, the sport was huge here. And then most of the races disappeared and... And I really liked the sport from the beginning, but I had to, to a lot of people said, oh, now these are the, the cyclocross clowns and the real stuff is happening on the road or, or the, the, the real stuff is happening on the mountain bike. And, and I always said, no, cyclocross is super nice. So it, it's really cool that now everyone else started to realize that, that cross is a super cool sport and good preparation and education for for other things that you can later do on the bike, yeah, it's 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 pretty fun to be around still and and uh, see the stuff that's happening now in in Swiss cyclocross, but also, I mean, also races in in other countries. Like I raced Munich a month ago, and Munich had world championships, but but then it just disappeared, and now there is a super nice Cat One race, and. Uh, big hobby race the day before so we also see it in other countries that uh stuff is happening again yeah and that's pretty cool to 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 be around that let me ask you this is the last question if uh if one of your kids wants to be a pro cyclocross racer are you going to uh green light that for them are they going to be able to uh to be a pro cross rider whether it's one of your sons or daughters yeah sure they have every support from us i think also from talking for my wife here i think you you learn so much in sport that I wouldn't say, no, this is too dangerous or this is too, too whatever, uh, the races are too far away or, or something. So they would have every support of, of me. And uh, when I'm not riding bikes, I really love on like working on bikes and uh, cleaning them, tuning them. So uh, if I could do that for, for my four kids, I'm not running out of work anytime soon. <laughs> so <laughs> that would be good. I, I think you'd be a busy guy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Cool. All right, Simon. I'm gonna wrap it there. I want to say thank you so much for your time. I want to wish you the best, the best of luck in the next two plus months of your season at the national championships and as well as the world championships. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to talk to you. And I want to thank you from everybody at GCN for taking the time to jam with us. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was super fun. So that is Simon Zahner. What a great dude he is. I truly, truly enjoyed that conversation. I hope that you guys did as well. If you weren't a fan before, well, I hope that you are now. Listening to him talk about his family, the upcoming world championships, he has a fun year and season ahead of him. So that's what I've got this week for you guys in the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave us a review. Please share it with your friends. As always, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for listening and we'll catch you guys next time.